Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Uh, this is the YouTube and podcast channel for the Greg Liar podcast, and I'm excited today to have Amy Hathaway. Amy has raised over $60,000 on DonorSea, and she's done a lot of impressive work in Tanzania, where she lived for, I believe, 12 years. And I'm here today to interview her about that work, hear how she got started in it, and it's just some of the most incredible work that of anyone I know, and I know a lot of people doing stuff like this. So I thought it would be good to do a deep dive into some of these topics. So Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. No problem, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so before we get started, I know that you have several kids, you have a, a whole family, and that's <laughs> something that you have on top of this work that you're doing. So do you wanna give us a little background about your yourself and the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, I'm almost 40 and I have six adopted children, um, five of them from the orphanage in Tanzania where I was working um, and one here from the UK. Um, so yeah, I went out to um, Tanzania in 2001 um, and I'm a teacher by trade. So I was working in a primary school um, and we were starting the adoption process and I just saw the, the awful state of orphanages basically um, out there. and. Um, just figured I could could do a better job, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I love that. Okay, so let me ask you this. What prompted you to go there in the first place? Um, okay, back in 1984, it was the Ethiopian famine. Um, and I was five years old and watching it on the news. Um, those photos of those emaciated babies with flies and ribs protruding. And I don't remember it, but apparently I said to my mom at the age of five, when I'm old, I'm going to help those babies. Um, and it was just something always I was going to do. So the second I could at 17, I left home and I did voluntary work in Zimbabwe for, for 12 months, um, working in an orphanage there. And then all through university, I worked in Romanian orphanages. Um, I don't know, I just, I was, I, I felt that that, that was the, the work I needed to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when, when I moved out to Tanzania, um, I just decided that, you know, I was working in a privileged international school. Um, it definitely wasn't the the job for me, and I knew that I was I was meant to to be helping. You know, people who who needed help, the poorest of the poor. That's interesting. I was actually teaching when I first went to Malawi. I taught at an international school as well, and it was kind of okay. the same. <laughs> some of the same thing. Like, yeah, this is nice and really fun, and obviously this makes an impact. But the real impact that I care about making is in 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 more desperate, extreme situations. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's, it's strange because I was I was happy at the international school. It was a good job. And, and in my future, I definitely saw, you know, helping orphans in the world or living in, in Africa forever. I didn't it wasn't planned at that time. Um, I went out with my husband and the plan was just to go for one or two years to have an adventure and then come to the UK and settle down. Um, I mean, it all started one day I was um, in the hospital. One of my friends was sick, admitted to the hospital. Um, and she was lying on a bed and it had blood on the, the bed sheet, not her blood. Mm -hmm. And she was just saying, please get me a new sheet, please. Um, so I kind of like scuttled off into the, the nurse's closet to, to look for a sheet. Um, and at the corner of my eye, I saw um, something move in the corner in this like metal crib thing. And I presumed it was a rat. I'd spent a lot of time in, in Tanzania at this point and just, you know, that was just my first assumption in the hospital. Um, something made me look and I peered into this cot um, and there were four emaciated babies there, basically. Um, I had mm -hmm. no idea how old they were. They could be anything from a day to, to two years. They were so, so emaciated and sick. Um, and at that moment, a nurse came in and shouted at me for, you know, being a, a white person intru intruding into her office. And, and I just said to her, you know, what are these babies here for? And she said, are they AIDS orphans? And kind of dismissed it. And I said, yeah, but these babies aren't dying of AIDS. They're dying of starvation. Like, you know, mm -hmm. who's looking after them? And she said, well, nobody. Do you want them? And I went home that night and I said to my husband, there's babies starving to death in this hospital. Like we have to do something. And we'd already started the social welfare process um, of adoption. So I knew the social worker and I went to see her the next day. And I said, there's these four babies dying of starvation. And she said, take them. Hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, I was 21 years old and, you know, wow, not yeah. particularly, yeah, n had no, no way I could care for these four babies. But I went every day to the hospital and I fed them and I looked after them and, and one by one, all of them died. Um, and I just thought that is in our day and age, it's just completely ridiculous. They died because they were starving. And, you know, regardless of what illness maybe they had, um, I, I just couldn't cope with, with that, that thought, to be honest. You know, I was working at a privileged school in a poor country and, and babies were starving. And, and to me, I could do something about it. You know, they needed milk. That's all they needed. So yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. I, what you just talked about is obviously a very hard thing. I, I, I remember a similar thing kind of happening to me 
when I had, I was in Malawi and I had uh, a friend in the hospital and it was like the local government hospital. And to get to uh, the wing of the hospital that my friend was in, I had to go through the neonatal ward where all of the babies were. And it's just hell on earth. It's just a whole mm -hmm. hallway. And you look into these rooms and it's mothers, for the most part, it's mothers uh, kind of like laying down in bed with their babies who are also emaciated and on the brink of starvation. And you just, and you just know, like, this is not going to end well for, for most of these people. Um, and, and then you also, you know, you also have this knowledge that the, the, the government funded hospitals are generally underfunded. They're not going to have, they're not going to be able to provide for these people in the way that they need. And it's just a tragic situation. So um, I kind of, I don't know, I have this like similar, I like, tw uh, like 2020 vivid uh, memory of something similar happening. And, um, and so like when you're talking about it, I'm having like these similar images pop up in my head and I'm just wondering what were some of those, when you found those four babies, what were some of the things that you did? Like, how did you cope with that? That's a, a tragic thing. And most people would be tempted to just run away. You know, what, what was it that, that made you think hard about that situation? Um, I don't know, honestly, it, it's, it's, none of my teacher friends understood it either but you know there were these four babies and they were gonna die and to me I just I just couldn't get my hand around you know I, I'm born into to white privilege I live in the UK I've never starved I've never gone to bed without a meal and you know my my family have always been there the thought that a baby was one starving and two gonna die alone it just didn't sit with with me and I knew that I had to do something um you know even when these babies actually slowly died the hospital's answer was you know, just just throw them away. There was going to be no funeral. There was going to be nothing for these babies. And mm -hmm. and even that, I I couldn't. I I you know I I paid for these babies' funerals because to me, they they were worth something. And I don't know. I honestly don't know what it was. And I could have walked away, sure, but um. I mean, yeah, surely but, you understand. Like, there's you talked about your you have friends in Tanzania. I have friends in Malawi who don't have the same reaction to me. That nothing wrong with that. They just kind of they come from a different perspective, I guess. And I, I'm just wondering, like what like what is it there's certain people that that act when they see these things and there's certain people that turn away and i'm just kind of wondering like what is that what is that thing um but i guess it's just like a personal conviction that you can't really express yeah. you know I'm, I'm not religious and and so many of my friends who are religious tell me that you know it's religion and, and it's god and i have god in my heart i just don't know it yet and mm -hmm. you know i don't know what it is i, I just know that it's it's 2018 and a baby should never die because it doesn't have milk you know we have we have surplus milk and we have surplus money in this country and to to know that that's happening just didn't sit with me and I knew I had to do something so mm -hmm. yeah it started with those four babies unfortunately none of them survived but you know they were yeah that's how we named the, the orphanage forever angels it was those four mm -hmm. angels so. oh nice okay now you talked about how in your country of surplus milk and I, I I believe the statistic in our country in America is that we throw away more food than we eat like that's like a, a, a well-known thing i'm wondering like what do you think about uh our what do you think about kind of first world society and their education on what's going on in the rest of the world the third world or the developing world whatever you want to call it yeah again i, I think a lot of it is um it's happening somewhere else and so it's someone else's problem and i think a lot through the 80s and 90s we were completely swamped with images of these you know Ethiopian orphans and starving people in Africa and I don't know if, if people saw too much of it and it became normal and so they've just seen it as oh well this is what happens in Africa this shouldn't happen anywhere it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what continent you're talking about you know it's um and I don't know we've got huge amounts of support um in, in the UK and America and Australia all over the world and there's some incredibly passionate people about but it's not the rich people that are supporting us you know it's the people that that are struggling and, and you know have have lowly paid jobs the same as the same as me and they're they're giving us their last bit of money for the month and supporting us it's it's not yeah. the the rich that, that's giving us the money and i don't know maybe that that's i find that really difficult that there's, there is so much money out there and just getting hold of it and being able to give it to the the people that actually need it is is so difficult it's kind of interesting that when you talk about the people who are giving money because we, we have a overlapping donor base because you're on donor c and so uh, you're raising a lot through there but we have a donor base that extends beyond people who give to you and you have a donor base that extends beyond people who give to us and so forth but um I think one of the things that's interesting is on donorcy as well, the, the people who are giving are not like super affluent for the most part. For the most part, it's like 
I'm, I, they're a hardworking person who has a job and they want they're, they see what's going on in the rest of the world and they want to, they want to give, like do their share for it. Um, yeah. but, but I think the reason that they come to donor C and the reason that they're really inspired by your projects is because they're able to help a specific person. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like a really meaningful thing for them. And, and it, I, that's kind of why donor C was started in the first place. Um, I mean, and that's so, huge, you know, for people to be able to help a named person is, is such a big thing. And again, you know, charity's got a bad name in the UK and all over the world, I guess, that, you know, how much, what percentage goes to administration and what, when does your money actually ever get to that person? And I think in a lot of cases, the answer is it doesn't, you know, I've, yeah. I've applied for grants that specifically for nutrition programs in the city where we work in Tanzania and we haven't received them and someone somewhere is getting them and yet not doing that work and that's mm -hmm. infuriating because oh, totally. you know I know that that money could save hundreds of lives and and yet the the small amounts of money that drip in that do save lives that there's so much more of that, that out there and it's just so difficult to to get hold of well this is something I talk about a lot I think that one of the I've I've said before on this podcast for people who have listened before that one of the kindest things you can do is you can critique charities because if you don't critique them then the people who lose out are the ones on the other side of the world who need the help right mm -hmm. if they're if if you're giving money to an organization and that organization isn't getting that money to the people in need and you just don't say anything about it you're not doing yep. favors to anyone except for maybe the donors you're sparing their feelings but who cares about that yeah. um and so yeah I would love to hear some more of what you think about some of the ways that charity is broken. And then, and then I think very highly of what you're doing. So what are you doing to correct some of those things? Yeah. Um, I don't know. We, we started, like, like I told you, I, I was a primary school teacher and I found these four babies and suddenly I needed to do something. So, you know, it was a matter of getting my friends and family together and saying, please do some fundraisers. We need some money. You know, we need a place to keep these babies. Um, so it, for the first probably six, seven, eight years, it was a very small family based charity where, you know, we had no overheads because my family were all supporting them. Um, I'm not saying that's a right or wrong, th wrong thing at all, because obviously charities need overheads, but we, I was just lucky that, that my family would, would support things like printing costs and we mm -hmm. didn't do very much marketing and advertising. It very much was, you know, we would have a car boot sale or a, a ball of some sort. We'd raise some money. That money would come to us. It would go directly to the, 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 the um, kids on the ground. I received no salary. I was a volunteer. Again, I was ridiculously lucky. My husband was working, um, and he had a good job and I didn't need to work. So I didn't need a salary anyway. So um, yeah, I worked, I worked 20 hour days, but I didn't receive a salary for it. And that that's just luck, to be honest. You know, we were in that, mm -hmm. that fortunate position. Um, I don't know, charity is broken. There's, there's, there's so much that needs to be done. You know, I lived in Tanzania for 12 years and every single day, everywhere you looked, you saw people that needed help and support. And I know that millions of pounds of UK money goes to Tanzania and I don't know where it goes. And that, I really struggle with that because, you know, you can see the good that Donor C can do that, you know, we raise money for formula milk for a baby, that baby gets formula milk and it's fat and healthy within six months. And I can mm -hmm. prove that to you with my photos and videos and, and there needs to be so much more of that happening. Um, even the malnourished wards in the, the government hospital don't provide any food for the children. The children are admitted and they get no food. They're there for malnutrition. That's the only thing they're there for. And, you know, somewhere along the line, I, I don't know what the answer is, to be honest, there's corruption, there's, lack of um you know giving to, to small grassroots charities i guess like us who are doing things you know there's this huge charities working in in tanzania there's unicef and oxfam and there's these massive charities i've never seen them work i've never seen them on the ground with the people i'm sure they're doing great things i don't know where or how um whereas the small charities that i see that they're working with individuals they're actually making change and impacting lives and yeah well, there's so little accountability going on like if, if you're in a remote part of tanzania then there's usually like one worker who's supposedly doing work out there, who's supposedly providing reports on how that how money is being spent, but no one's keeping track of it. That's I mean that's like what's the problem. And they do have like internal audits and so forth, but those internal audits are not comprehensive, and they don't like even if they discover something, a lot of times that that there's like a really high chance it never makes it back to the donor, even if they find massive fraud. Uh, there's a yeah. the the charities are incentivized not to say anything about that. Um, and so, yeah, that's why that's a big reason for the idea behind donor is, is you give a donation and, and then uh, you get to see exactly what happened. And then, you know, OK, well, my money did that. This, like this video in front of me is, is a result of my donation that I gave. And I don't have to wonder what's going on. Um, so anyways, I appreciate you being involved in that and in such a uh, impressive way. Um, as I've been uh, 
working with donor C and, and, and working with you a lot of times, whenever we're about to make a big change, you're one of the first people I talk to because <laughs> you're such an active person on the platform. Um, and I really value your opinion. So one of the things that is, is a question right now is overhead cost and um, w how much we should allocate to operating expenses. And that's something that is like, it's difficult because um, on the one hand, you want all of your money to help the people in need. Like that's why you started this. That's why you, you do something like this is you want people to get money uh, so that they can survive or, or get uh, formula milk or get hearing aids okay. or whatever it is. But then on the other hand, you want more than just that one person to be helped. You want people to, to know about donor C or right. know about forever angels. And you want lots of babies to get formula milk, not just the one that your money is going to, but the, the ability for 10,000 more or a million more people to be helped in a, in a substantial and sustainable way. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. So what are your, some of your thoughts on overhead? This is obviously a big discussion for donor C right now. Yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, for the first six or seven years, we didn't have any overheads at all. We were we were really lucky in that respect. But um, as we started to grow um, and, and as we basically completely absorbed all of my friends and family and they were like, don't ask anymore. We're done. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh <-huh. laughs> At that point, I was like, OK, we need to find more donors. Um, and so then we started to, to do things like, you know, paid Facebook ads and not a lot of money. I'm talking like, you know, 10 pounds a month or something. But we're reaching different amounts of people. And um yeah, and that I, I now take a salary from from the organization because I do all of the work here in the UK. Um, and we're actually looking at the moment in employing someone else. You know, we're, we now have about a quarter of a million um, income per year, but there's just me um, working mm -hmm. for, in the UK. And um, as we're growing, we're now just, we were a baby home, but now we have three um, outreach centers across Tanzania um, doing the, the Maisha Matters work. So supporting babies in their own homes. And um and it's becoming a huge task. So, you know, in order to, to raise money and get grants and stuff, we actually need to to start spending money on on employees and um, yeah, marketing more and advertising and and that that doesn't come for free. So um mm -hmm. yeah, like I said, we we've grown from from nothing to now we have to spend money. And I don't like it, you know, but a huge part of me is yeah. like, oh, my husband gets some more money so I don't have to take a salary. <laughs> like I yeah. hate taking a salary. But you know, if I didn't, I, I believe it the whole place would collapse because someone has to be running it on the ground here you know I'm I'm mm -hmm. training in Tanzania I'm getting volunteers I'm doing all the fundraising I'm doing the marketing I'm all the money that's that's collected in in the UK and sent out to Tanzania that's all done by me so yeah it's it's a full-time job and but it is it's difficult to 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 work out what percentage or you know to to, to, to find a value on that is is it's very difficult and um I think you're doing the right thing in in terms of speaking to the donors and and getting their opinion because you know so many charities use ridiculous amounts of overheads and and as we've said they then the money still doesn't get to the the right people at the end of the day um mm -hmm. as long as your your people can can still prove that the the money's helping and and um you know causing huge change and giving impact to these families then yeah I think it's a it's a good thing mm -hmm. yeah I think the if if anyone has been reading my blogs, one of the the ways I've been trying to express this conundrum is that if would you rather have ninety nine percent of ten thousand dollars going to help emaciated babies, or would you rather have sixty percent of a million dollars going to help emaciated babies? Those are obviously two extremes. Like like we're not going to yeah. do either either of those things. Um, but but the principle is there. Like there there should be some kind of happy balance where you can reach more people um, while still giving the majority of your money to people in need and in a way, like you're, what you're doing is you're 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 taking that whatever that percentage is or that that is going to operating expenses or marketing or Facebook ads as you called it, that money is being used to find more donors to plug into your system so you can yeah. uh, do more work. And I I think that that's like a a really healthy model if you've if you're doing truly meaningful work. And I, I believe that yeah that, yeah and and obviously you don't want to raise money if you're not doing meaningful work, but that's up to the donors to decide. But it's a very healthy conversation to have. Okay. I, we've talked this whole time and like, maybe people don't know exactly what you're doing with Maisha Matters. And it's like, <laughs> that's why I wanted people to come to this podcast in the first place. So why don't you, you describe the process of what you guys, of what you guys do in Tanzania and you're expanding. You just, you're in like three locations now, or you expanded mm -hmm. to three. So yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love for you to talk more about that. Sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, we've changed our, our model and we've grown so much over the last 12 years. So when we first opened, like I said, we, we had a baby home. Um, social services would call us when a mother had died in childbirth. We would look after this baby for six months to 12 months, um, giving it milk, getting it healthy again. And then we'd work with the relatives and and that baby would, would go home. Um, we also got a lot of children who were abandoned, you know, thrown in 
graveyard churches on the side of the road just just left um, and also a lot of children with special needs who've been abandoned so we grew from a, a capacity of 20 to about 65 children of varying ages and disabilities um, that would be with us and we've always um, really focused on on family reunification that was one of the most important things I didn't ever want to be an orphanage um, we've always called ourselves an interim care home so our goal is to to get children when they're at the most vulnerable um, and they have nowhere to go and to find them some sort of loving family that's the goal um 80 of our children have returned home to their their biological families or been adopted into new families um, that's an astounding percentage 80 percent. that's amazing it is yeah it is i mean it's i think it's one of the biggest definitely in in east africa you know it's, it's something we we totally pride ourselves on and it's 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 a huge part of, of of what i do is you know we believe in family um but then over the course of the years i i in fact, it was one woman. Um, she was a grandmother, and the mother had just died in childbirth. And she was bringing me this this newborn baby, and um, and as she said goodbye, she was crying. And she said, "Ah, oh, I wish I could keep her." And then a just alarm bells went off in my head, and I was like, "Well, of course you can keep her. Like, you know, she needs milk. That's all. She doesn't need to come into this center." And and I said to her, "Look, can you do you know how to? Can you get milk?" And she's like, "No, I can't." And I was like, "Okay, if I give you milk, can you care for this baby?" And she was overjoyed. "Yes, I can. I can." And and I was like, what are we doing? Like social welfare are giving us these babies, but actually they don't ever need to come to us. If they've got a loving relative that can can feed them, we can provide the milk. Actually, they never need to become an orphan. They can always stay in their family. So um, yeah, about four and a half years ago, we totally switched around and our numbers in the the, the baby home of, of more than half, you know, we went from 65 to about 29. Um, and the, the babies that are there now are, are are true orphans, you know, true orphans or abandoned. We, we don't know where their, their relatives are, so they can't go home. Um, and we'll work to find adoptive families for them. Um, now, any baby whose mother's died in childbirth, um, they're referred to us and um, and we support that family. So it's a, it's a year long program. They come um, every week to us and we give formula milk. Um, and then we do training workshops um, every Tuesday and these families come and we train them on HIV, malaria, um, health and hygiene, first aid, nutrition, um, child development and, and then business skills. And then after about four to six months, um, we set the family up in a business that they can run from home so they can become empowered and sustainable and they can hopefully care for their, their family into the future. So when the milk stops at like six to seven months, um, they're able to, to support that infant themselves. Mm -hmm. So I have a bunch of questions from from all of that. One of the the first questions that comes to mind is um, these these babies that are abandoned uh, and and they show up to you. What are some of their stories like? How do you find them, and uh, how is it that they eventually end up uh, under your care? Yeah. Um, so I mean, a lot of times they're they're found by just you know passers by in in drop hole toilets and churches. We had one three weeks ago, um, a little girl that was inside a sack and some school kids found her on the way home from school. Um, now we're like the main referral center um, in the city we are. So any of these babies that are found would be taken to the police or the social welfare or the like the village leader that they have. Um, and all of them know us so that we would just get a phone call and say, there's a baby, come get it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a regular occurrence. We get one, two, three new babies um, a month sometimes mm -hmm. more, sometimes less. Um, but yeah, I mean, with with a main referral center now for, for any baby at all that, that's abandoned. Well, I mean, what is going through your mind with these babies that are just left in sacks? I mean, I hear that and I, it's horrifying. Uh, it's horrifying. You know, that that's an extreme case. It happened three weeks ago and, and I, I, I'm still struggling with it. You know, when, mm -hmm. they're, when they're left on the roadside or at hospitals or churches or when they're abandoned, um, I feel for the baby, but actually I feel for the mum so much as well, because, you know, it's a desperate act to do that. I'm a mum to six children and I can't imagine ever giving my baby away. And I know that there'd have to be some pretty desperate situations. And mm. and some of them we found out, you know, the situation afterwards, and it is that the mum was was being severely abused and the baby was being abused. And she, that you know, she's, she's, she's abandoned her baby because she wants to save its life. And there's, there's some really tragic stories that oh, we've I heard. Um, the, the ones where, you know, a baby's tied in a sack and or thrown in a toilet you know I, I really struggle with them but yeah. again I think I think there's a lot of mental illness as well um you know postpartum um mental illness is a real a real thing in Tanzania and you very often get these mothers that have given birth and all the hormones you know they they make them have, have psychotic episodes and they don't necessarily know what they're doing and you know we've had a lot of those cases as well so in the UK that would be monitored in a hospital and you'd be given medication and you'd have your baby a few weeks later whereas in Tanzania you know the, the, there's no such help and support so 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's it's extremely sad for for the for the baby and and for the mum. You know, my heart actually goes out to both of them. There's no mental health support particularly. There's no support for for young mothers. In fact, it's a it's a criminal offence to to abandon your baby. So mm-hmm. it's also a criminal offence to have an abortion. So if you're a 13 year old that's been raped, which happens a lot, and you find yourself pregnant. One, you'll be thrown out of school. The, gov- the, the um, president says you are not allowed to attend school anymore. So your future is pretty much in the in the dirt. Um, it's illegal for you to have an abortion and it's illegal for you to go to social services and say, I don't want this baby. You're not mm. allowed to do that. So, you know, women have absolutely no choice. In the UK, we, we, could, we could abort our child if we wanted to. We could go to social services tomorrow and say, I don't want this child or I can't raise this child. And, and we would get help and support in that. But in Tanzania, women, they have just, just no options at all. So... Yeah, and I on think top it's of a... everything else in Tanzania, there uh, w- women are don't have the same status that they would have in the UK. I assume nope. Uh, nope. they're they're not seen uh, with the same amount of I don't know. Would you call it respect or status or something like that? Absolutely not at all. You know, there's there's men and then there's you know women and, and children are down at the very very bottom down here. Yeah. Um, yeah, women have have no rights whatsoever. If they don't want more children, they have no no say in that. Um, you know, contraception is is difficult to get hold of and again most men wouldn't use it anyway um so yeah i mean w- w- women live with really tough lives in tanzania and yeah if, if they get pregnant after already having four or five or six or seven or ten children you know an extra mouth to feed can actually you know cause that family to to go deeper and deeper into poverty and sometimes by by having that desperate move of giving a child away and, and hopefully knowing that it's gonna have a good life somewhere else maybe they're, they're doing a you know an active service for that child and really believing that they're, they're doing the best they can for them yeah, it's such an interesting perspective because obviously I hear that and I'm I'm just like, you know, it, it, it kills me to even think about a baby being abandoned, but then it kills me even more to think about like the, the difficulty of the situation of the, that these people are in. I, I just, I, yeah. it is such a, the, the level it is of hard poverty. Because people, yeah. people give such negative, you know, views of these women and, but, you know, I can sit there and cradle this newborn baby and give it so much love. And I know that this baby is going to have a good life because I know that I'm going to find an adoptive family for this baby mm-hmm. that's in my arms right now. And from this moment on, it's never going to feel hunger and, you know, it's going to be okay. And my mind just always drifts to who is this mom and, and what's she doing right now? Like, you know, and yeah, yeah. I, I do find it difficult to get those moms out of my head. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it's and they have a hard life ahead of them, but they also have had a hard life up to that point, obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. I, I but know. it's not it's not just um, it's not just babies whose mothers have died in childbirth. We actually have some mothers who actually they would have given their baby up if it wasn't for our program. So mothers who um, hmm. I've had some that have had epileptic um, seizures and fallen into a fire, so they've burnt their breasts and they're no longer able to breastfeed, so their baby was starving. We've got others that have had breast cancer and they aren't able to breastfeed. Um, you know, for, for multiple reasons, we've got we've got mothers who actually aren't able to feed their child but do want them. But in in without my Shimata's program, they would have had to actually abandon their baby because they wouldn't be able to afford the milk or their baby would have died of starvation. So um, you know, 90% of our program is grandmothers and aunties who are caring for the baby because mums died. But we have a few mums on the program as well. Okay, so that was, so one of the questions I think our viewers might be wondering is these babies that are coming into your care, um, what happens? Like I, I assume they're there for a temporary amount of time, then they go on to be adopted or what's the plan for them? Yeah. Um, so yeah, any, any baby that comes to us is registered under social welfare. We're not allowed to just accept any baby, you know, we're a licensed children's home. So they're all, they're all placed, um, with us by social welfare. And, um, there's a a growing program of adoption in Tanzania now, which is brilliant. It used to be pretty much just expatriates that were, were, were adopting. Um, we've been to mosques and churches and temples, and we've just tried to spread the word as much as possible. And there's so many more Tanzanian adoptions happening now. So pretty much when I get a baby, I got this one three weeks ago. And the day that she arrived, I had someone come and say we'd like to adopt her. Um, so she'll be in our care for about four to six months um, just to make sure that no one comes back to, to find her. Um, mm-hmm. Police will do a report. Um, and the social welfare, um, they do all of the adoption process. So it's, it's nothing to do with me. We basically are told this family are coming to, to take this baby for adoption. And it's all very official. You know, we can't just agree it amongst ourselves. It's, a, it's an official process. The adoption process takes between six months and two years, depending. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, most people obviously want want the newborn babies, um, but we have had many people come and adopt four, five year old boys, six, you know, older girls, which is is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, the children who who don't get chosen for adoption are the children with special needs, um, and so we have blind children, children with hydrocephalus, um, children with cerebral palsy, um, children with autism. We have we have a whole range mm. of children who are actually 9, 10, 11, 12 years old now. Um, so even though we're a baby home, we still have these these older children because um, no one's chosen them for adoption and um, and they're not going to go home. We don't know who their relatives are. So that's difficult. And, yeah. the, you know, the, the future outlook for them, I, I don't really know what it is, to be honest. It's mm -hmm. That's tough. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I wouldn't, that's just a tough situation. Um, but I appreciate that you are, are there to do something about it. And I also want to say when, when you're describing these things, I'm thinking people who come on the donor scene and they see your projects, uh, it's like, when they give formula milk to that baby, they're they're doing two things. One, they're they're just like sparing the baby's life until they can find a loving home. But then the second thing they're doing is, I, if if the baby continues to be malnourished, they're going to suffer from, uh, uh, from brain problems throughout the rest of their lives because mm -hmm. of this mal this the the malnourishment in the in the very first few weeks of their yeah. life. So, w do you have some more information that you'd like to share about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the first thousand days are the most important in terms of a child's development and, and nutrition. Um, so that's the first three years of life. We get sometimes four and five year olds coming in who are severely malnourished and they are developmentally delayed. And, you know, trying to overcome that is a huge thing. So as much as possible, um, if we can get the, these babies young and starting on, on, on good nourishment, um, it actually can affect their lives. You know, these, these babies are coming from desperate poverty. Um, and their families can't afford milk. So they're living in, you know, they're, 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 they're the most poverty stricken people. So the likelihood of them going to school is is small anyway. So if we can just try to break that cycle by, you know, making sure they are nourished, making sure their brains develop normally, making sure that their families can set up a business um, and and hopefully the, from, from that child to go to school, you know, hopefully that cycle of poverty can can be broken and that, that child can can do better than what it's, it's family did and you know mm -hmm. make changes but you know we, we've seen some amazing entrepreneurial um skills coming from some of our families you know we had a grandmother who um wanted to set up a business to she had twins her, her daughter died in childbirth and she was raising these twins and they were so malnourished when they came to us so we gave formula milk and we said to her you know what can you do a job and she's like well you know i used to be able to braid hair and i said well fantastic you know let's let's do a hair salon that's brilliant and you know we set her up with um, a very small little hair salon where you know bought some fake hair and just a little room that we rented for her um, and she's done so amazingly she's now got two people working for her she's built a cafe on the side of her hair salon for people to come and get chai and donuts and things while they're having their hair done wow. um she, she's just done so so well and and for this little old lady that you know, brought in these dying twins to me one day. I just think, you know, sometimes you just need to give someone a chance and it doesn't cost a lot of money. And you know, I think that project cost like $150 mm -hmm. um, to set up and to buy the equipment that she needed. And from that, you know, her kids are healthy. They're thriving. They're both going to be enrolled in school next year. And, you know, she's doing amazingly well. So the, yeah. the, there are some some cases where, you know, it doesn't go right. And, you know, I think Donacy is a really good platform because you can tell the truth and you can say, you know, this is what happened and this is what we're going to do about it. And and even in the UK, you know, some families just need that extra bit of support. And, and it's the same in Tanzania. Yeah, I mean, I like to tell people that when you give, it's, it's think of it like an investment. Like you want the majority of your money to go on and do really good things. But sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it fails. But like you talked about earlier, you have something like an 80% success rate. And that's just phenomenal. Yeah. That's like unheard of. So I, I really applaud you for that. Um, we, you know, talking about all this stuff, it's for you and I, we're in this every day. It's like we're used to talking <laughs> about it. Maybe some of our listeners, uh, it, they're driving to work and this is not a common thing. And I don't want to leave people thinking that um, it's this is like this hopeless situation or whatever. Like I find a lot of gratitude in working on Donorcy and I know you find a lot of gratitude in working with Forever Angels because um, – it's it's not about the 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 hardships or the difficulties or whatever, but it's about all of the good that happens from being able to invest in this type of work. Um, and so yeah, so I I want to the people who are listening who are in their cars or whatever wherever you are, um, this is like a huge honor to be able to to be involved in this kind of thing. And and I'm I'm really grateful to know people like Amy who are doing doing things like that. So Amy, do you have any uh, last words that you want to leave people with before um, before we take off? Um, no, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I say to my kids all the time, it's that 
building forever angels has changed so many lives out in tanzania you know like we've saved 500 babies lives and we've given you know hundreds of babies new adoptive families and it's changed so many lives but actually it's affected so many lives here in the uk as well by you know the little girl that sells lemonade on, on the side of her road to the old ladies that knit blankets for our babies to the volunteers that have met and ended up getting married and you know yeah. just there's, there's so many lives that have been impacted because of because of forever angels um, and the work that we do all over the world and for that i do i do feel privileged to have to, to know such generous people and um yeah to be part of, of work where every day even though sometimes it can be you know very up and down life over there very difficult and very raw I get to see such good things and, and good people and, and people helping. And that's, that's just huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tremendous honor to be able to be a part of it. And the world is not okay, but it's a, a, it's really nice to be able to do something about it. So Amy, thank you for taking the time to chat with us no and problem. anyone who is interested in learning more about Amy, I, I believe it's, is it foreverangels.com? Org. Dot org. So foreverangels.org. Yeah. And then you can also find Amy on Donorsy and she's very, she's very active and you can like, you can donate directly to her work in a very personal way. And she does a great job with that. So probably on the front page of Donorsy, you'll find some Amy Hathaway projects. <laughs> All right, Amy, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye. Thanks, Greg. Bye.